Crystal, let's move on to millennials. Uh, we're, we're both millennials, aren't we? Yeah, I'm barely, barely. I'm like an old millennial. You're an elder millennial. Yes, I am. I'm a senior millennial. <laughs> well, this, this, <laughs> this article caught our eye because it crunches some new numbers on how millennials are faring. And I know a lot of our audience is definitely in the millennial camp. Take a look at this tear shade. It's, it's D1. This headline in particular, people were circulating it on Twitter because it seems shocking. Uh, the headline from Business Insider here is, meet the average American millennial who's a parent and homeowner with a net worth of $128,000 and hoping for student debt relief. The article says, uh, the, and here's where some of the, the numbers get interesting. As of 2019, the median millennial household income when adjusted for inflation was roughly $10,000 higher, higher than those of median Gen X and boomer households at the same age. So this is comparing millennials, a snapshot of millennials right now to the same snapshots of Gen X and boomer households at the same nay, at the same time. They say it's taken millennials some time to catch up to prior generation when it comes to wealth. Uh, the Fed in St. Louis, they did an analysis of 2016 data. It found that families of older millennials had a median wealth of about 30% lower than people of prior generations at the same age. But by the time 2019 data was available, that ga gap had shrunk to 11%. And then a, an analysis of 2022 data found that, quote, young Americans, so that's people uh, from about 33 to 34, millennials had roughly the same average wealth adjusted for inflation as Gen X did at the same age. Now, that's a, that's a very specific cohort, 33 to 34. That's not millennials more broadly. And I think that's some of the problem with this number, with these numbers, is that like you can find numbers that um, are very specific to so, like 33 to 34, as opposed to millennials that are like 27 to 40 at right. this point, and yeah. jump in at a specific period of time, pull that number out and say, listen, millennials are fine. Um, but Homeownership, millennials hit the majority homeownership rate. Actually, according to Rent Cafe, um, that was, uh, what was that, last year? Um, and apparently, so the average millennial was 34 years old when the generation reached that milestone. Uh, Gen X and boomers were 32 and 33. So again, you have uh, business insiders saying, they weren't that far behind. Um, but again, that's actually not accurate either because we don't know until uh, millennials are, like, we, we actually don't know until we have a clear information on, like, the 27-year-olds, right? Like, by right. the time they've reached the age, they're not 34 yet. Uh, they're, right. they're not necessarily at the average yet. So I, I don't know. I think this is all really premature, and I, I had to include this National Review article. We can put the next element up on the screen, because this, to me, um, playing semantics with the word crisis, saying the student debt crisis doesn't actually exist, saying it's bad, but it's not a crisis, because Americans have all kinds of other debt that we don't call a crisis. It's just an absurd... Maybe we should call that other debt a crisis. Right, Certainly yeah. the medical debt is a crisis. Exactly. And here's the, the line that really I thought was such a tell and just incredible. Quote, the vast majority of student loan borrowers have manageable debt burdens of $5,000 to $40,000. Oh, yeah. Manageable Real manageable. $40,000 in debt. Super manageable. I don't care if you're going to be a doctor. Coming into your... Which is not the case with, with most of those people... And by the way, there are a lot of outliers in millennial among millennials who have like crazy amounts of debt, like pushing six figures. Oh yeah, um, and those are for degrees that uh, are not going to make it easy to pay it off. But even if you're talking about an average from five to forty thousand, the average I think graduates with closer to forty thousand. So whether or not it's five or forty thousand right now is a different question. We've seen poll after poll show millennials saying that has made them put off marriage, it has made them put off home ownership, it's made them put off all kinds of different normal milestones. And so yet having to scrape by for years and years and years where you are, for instance, Lyman Stone at the uh, has crunched numbers over and over again, showing women have fewer children than they say they want. Yes. That's really freaking sad. And that is a consequence in some ways of putting off marriage, of putting off home ownership and all of these different milestones because you are bogged down in debt, um, in student loan debt in particular. The polling has found that is an influence on this. And the same thing goes for, um, like you're saying, medical debt and all those other things. It is a crisis. Crisis, whether it's student loans or medical debt or anything else, it's absolutely a crisis, and it does prevent people from having lives that they wanted to see themselves have. Yeah. I mean, this is part of, first of all, let's think about the framing of this article that's like, older millennials, it's not even all millennials, older millennials have maybe started to catch up to boomers. Yeah. Is that our standard for a country? 
that like younger generations may possibly at some point in their lives be able to achieve the same level of success as older generations. It it's has always, always been the opposite. It's always been the aspiration. Of course, you want your kids to do better than you do. So the very fact that we've lowered our, lowered our goals to be like, maybe one day by the age of like 45, you'll have a shot of achieving <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. what your boomer parents and grandparents were able to achieve. Like that's a sad statement in and of itself. But I also think, you know, part of what is missed in this analysis is how much the landscape has changed in terms of, as you're pointing to, Emily, like housing is wildly unaffordable. Yeah. So those milestones in terms of home ownership get pushed back, which means that you have many fewer years of like building wealth as a homeowner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that gets pushed back. Since you don't have that um, ability to, to own a home and be financially stable and secure, you, you wait to get married, you wait to have kids. Healthcare has become wildly more unaffordable. Education, wildly more unaffordable. So all of those sort of bedrock pieces of a middle-class life have become so much more expensive way before we started talking about inflation. And some of those pieces are not really reflected in this analysis that make up like, how do you just have a stable middle-class life? So um, I also think, you know, the picture is very different for younger millennials versus older millennials. And so the data is also a little bit um, cherry picked. They say the typical millennial earns between 52,000 and 62,000 a year. But again, that really depends on whether you are at the upper end mm -hmm. of that age spectrum or the lower end. And overall, I think you have a generation that has just been made so much more precarious by the fact that some of these core pieces of a stable and thriving life have become so unattainable. And we see the way that the, the life milestones get pushed back and back and back. And sometimes that gets sold to us as like, oh, that's just the way the kids wanna live these days. <laughs> but then you go and ask women like, okay, but how many kids did you actually wanna have? And it's more than they were able to have. And you can see this isn't because of some life choice. It's because of the economic circumstances that were forced on them. I will say though, um, they point to data from 2016 16 that showed millennials way further behind where boomers and Gen X were at their age. And there seems to have been some catch up over the years. And I do think, you know, part of what happened with the pandemic recovery mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. is it did really help. Um, it helped a lot of millennials. It helped a lot of people who were at the lower end of the income spectrum. They were able to save a little bit of money. They were able to uh, change jobs, move locations. Remote work has made it possible to live in more affordable locales so that they can also save more money or have just better quality and balance of life. So I do think that some of those programs have continued to contribute positively to the, the life trajectory, particularly of young people. And I think that speaks to where some of this is very polarized. Like the pandemic economy was was great for some people overall, millennials included, and really bad for some people overall, millennials included. And that's similar. I mean, the, the article talks about, obviously, millennials, many of whom graduated as the Great Recession was uh, either about to happen or had just happened. And that's, I mean, that, that put a lot of people off on a very bad foot. And yeah. they've been trying to, and that's also Americans in general, net worth has not recovered from the Great Recession still. Um, it is still not where it was before, which is, I think, a huge factor underestimated in and why people are like, listen, the economy is fine. Like, right. So, well, maybe it's fine for Jamie Dimon and his friends, but it's not as good as it was. People are not in as good of a position as it was. To your point about like why we're celebrating millennials catching up as opposed to exceeding where everyone else was. And I think it's really uh, interesting to see libertarians downplay the level of student debt people graduate with because so much of that has to do with government subsidies, putting the price of our college education is wildly out of whack. So it's not even just that people are in debt for a wonderful, fantastic, great education. It's that because the government subsidies have flooded, you are going $40,000 in debt on average for a terrible education that is like led by all of these bureaucrats that now outnumber teachers on college campuses. So it's just rich to see that downplaying happen because that's never ever been how we approach uh, generational growth in the United States. And it's just sad to see us cheer 
cheerleading um, and picking numbers where you say, oh, the average millennial is married and, and uh, they have kids. And it's like, they probably got married way later than they wanted to. And they, they may have had a whole lot of emotional scarring on the way. They probably wanted to have more kids. On average, we know that's true of women than they ended up having. having. And even if they own a house, they might not be really uh, happy with the house that they own. That did happen with the pandemic. You had housing prices uh, go down. A lot of millennials take advantage of it. But now those millennials who didn't take advantage of it because they were you know, 23 or whatever, right. I guess maybe 25. <laughs> yeah. Um, good luck. Good luck to them. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And and um, just to, to wrap this up from the, the libertarian perspective, I mean, if you're in that kind of debt, like you're not free. Like talk about like yep. freedom and ability to chart your own course and yep. um, make your own path. And that's reflected in the numbers of um, young people who say that that debt burden, specifically from student debt, keeps them from launching the businesses mm -hmm. and becoming the entrepreneurs that they want to be because they got to have that steady check to be able to make sure they're still servicing that debt. So in a very real way, it really limits people's choices and what they're able to do with their lives. So Don't listen, tell me that's not a crisis. I certainly support debt cancellation. You don't have to support that, but you can't pretend that this isn't a crisis and you know just wish your way out of it and not have some sort of a solution for what is um, hobbling now Gen Z and millennials. And what a waste of energy to play semantics with the word. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You can't deny reality. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.